Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And if you're listening to this on the uh, day it dropped, happy Black Friday. I hope Steam has not bled you dry. Uh, yes, happy Black Friday. Hap- I-, I will say several times, happy gaming, happy, uh, happy savings. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, I'm already dreading how much money I'm going to spend on the Steam sale. But I won't be in my home state. I'll be away on vacation-ish, so maybe that'll save my wallet, but I'm not holding my breath on that one. Yeah, same thing. Um, and, uh, but changing the subject to why we are here today, I'm um, continuing and trying to link together some kind of, um, uh, MCU-esque narrative to our podcast. I mean, not quite that detailed. We don't have any post-credit scenes, although I feel like everything's going to have post-credit scenes. Uh, uh, we actually accidentally had a post-credit scene in an early episode. Oh, did we? Yeah. Um, that. when we first posted the episode, I had left on, I, I had cut something out like us goofing off or something, uh, before we had started recording that day. And I threw it at the end of the of the session, like two minutes after, so it was out of the way, and I wouldn't mistake it. And then and when, when I bounced it out of uh, Pro Tools, and um, I, I had a, a a friend of mine who was a regular listener messaged me and went, "What was that weird thing at the end after you finished up?" And I was just like, "What thing? You were like whispering or something?" And I'm like, "Oh God, no!" And, and <laughs> Yes, and so I updated it, and so no, no longer is it there. You won't know what episode it was, but thank you, Kieran, for pointing that out. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Kieran. Um, but anyway, uh, back to, to the point at hand. Point so at hand. K- trying to weave our discussions together. Um, we talked a lot about, about achievement culture last time, and a lot of the games I found that had some of the worst achievements were, of course, licensed games, which will go into the modern era licensed games because that's not a blanket statement. It's just kind of what I'd encountered, Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to take it way back to the uh, 8-bit era and talk about old school licensed game because being a licensed game wasn't always like uh, this horrible title or this fearful endeavor back in the Nintendo, Super Nintendo Genesis eras. I mean, some of my favorite games were licensed games, like the whole Disney afternoon run of games, like all of them that Capcom did were phenomenal. Yeah, even the weakest ones of those was... A good game. I mean, we mentioned a few episodes back the Disney Afternoon Collection on the PS4, which uh-huh. I am still playing and I am still loving. Yeah, and, sure, And it's yeah. not even nostalgia. Several of those games I had never played before, and like DuckTales 2, uh, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers 2, like they're, they're solid. Yeah, they are solid games. I remember Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers 2. I don't remember DuckTales 2, though I might have played it. But uh, but yeah, like I love the Darkwing Duck game, you know, the even later on, the later years, the Gargoyles game they put out, like all of that stuff I loved. And back then, they, they, they added such care to that stuff. I mean, Capcom also did a bunch of other Disney properties, like um, they did the Aladdin game for both Genesis and Super Nintendo. And to this day, people will fight to the death over which version was better. I grew up with the Genesis version, so I happened to look fondly on that version. But I did later on play the Super Nintendo version, which was also very good. But that's not the kind of discussion you have now with Thor the game when the first Thor game came out. Yeah, it's um, and, and it's it's very interesting because I think a lot of game licenses like that, when you get a, a movie property or a television property, it's sort of run through the filter of what is the popular uh, genre of the day. And... While in the 8-bit and 16-bit era, that typically meant, well, let's make it a platformer, which right. doesn't necessarily make it a faithful game. It certainly can be, you, you, you can get away with a slipshod, mediocre platformer. It's not going to remain in hearts and minds unless you really like the, the property, but it, it's at right. least, you know, you, you, can, you, you can squeak one out okay. Nowadays, well, yeah. yeah. We can talk about modern in a bit, but like Batman's Nintendo game had very little to do with Batman. I mean, like, I think the Joker was in it and like you sometimes fought criminals, but for the most part, it was like soldiers and tanks and robots. And and it was a platformer with gadgets. I think mostly just the Batarang and the grappling hook. But like, yeah, he was Batman. There was the 8-bit version of Tim Burton's theme in there and all of that stuff. And it was a good platformer, which made it one of the best. Batman games to date until fairly recently. Yeah, it, it was you know it was the closest to getting the idea of Batman, and even then, missing widely on the mark, still made it a decent game. Whereas on the other hand, uh, the X Men NES game. 
Oh yeah. Is uh infamously bad. It is um it the the only thing that it gets correct about the X-Men is the uh profile uh they have for them in the character select. And even that yeah. that information is is dodgy. But after that it, it uh captures none of the feel of the X-Men. It represents the characters not at all and is in fact just a terrible game in general. It it uh if you remove the X-Men for, a, a good thing to look at is in some of these games uh, faithfulness aside, if you take the characters out, is it still a good game? And, right. And that one was not. Batman was. Right, yeah. I remember the only way I was able to beat that X-Men game was with um, Cheat Codes, Game Genie. And mm-hmm. like even then, it was like, this game still isn't fun. And I'm cheating. And usually that's a lot of fun with Game Genie. And it was just, it was not. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, the and the X-Men game, uh, personally, I have a very fun kind of like memory experience of it. Because I remember renting it from Blockbuster. Mm-hmm. And until a few years ago, if you asked me about that game, I could kind of hum you a little bit of like what the the music sounded like when you picked the characters. Mm-hmm. And I remember just dying a lot. I remember the gameplay not lasting very long. And I probably remember the character select screen because I spent most of my time playing it at that screen. And I couldn't say much about the gameplay. And then a few years ago, through the magic of emulation and things, I'm like, all right, let me let me tackle this. I was really interested in seeing all the old X-Men games at the time that I'd either missed or whatever else. And oh my god. Now I have better sense memories of just how abysmal it is. Uh and also not to change the subject completely, but to talk Sorry. a little bit about pre Nintendo um adaptations, because there were a few that I remember at least, like on the Atari, like Superman, which of course all Superman games for the most part are pretty awful. Uh and that one included. And then of course there's the famous, and we won't go into much detail, but the famous movie adaptation failure of a game, which is, of course, E.T., mm-hmm. which, as far as I know, is still buried in the desert of New Mexico. They, they unearthed it. Oh, did they? I, I think, like, maybe two years ago, I want to say, in, like, the uh, 2014, 2015 around-ish. Like, they, uh, basically, an excavation happened, or an expedition happened to find it, and they were uh, they were dug up, and a couple of them were auctioned off, and, yeah, no, they, uh, they got unearthed not too long ago. Um, but that game, of course, is notoriously terrible, uh, mostly because it was just badly designed. And that it goes back to what we've been saying since the episode started, is if you design a good game and put a character that's popular in it, then you're at least going to have a good game. You know, which back in the 8-bit and 16-bit era, and even 32-bit, was easier to do than, say, in the modern gaming, because there's so many more bells and whistles that are expected. That said, also, just to be clear, uh, a licensed game is, for the one person listening who may not know, is a game based on another property. Um, You could argue something like the Ninja Turtles, who have kind of existed in perpetuity in gaming for so long, wouldn't be considered a licensed property to you, but it is because it started in comic books and cartoons and most of the games are based on, with some exceptions, some version of it, either the movies, the comic books, or the games. There are a few uh, Ninja Turtle video games that kind of were original content and design like uh, out uh, there was a new one that came out at the ra- same time as the new movie out of the shadows right. that the design of was wholly original like they didn't look like any other version mm-hmm. but it still sort of followed existing stories um so you know that these are the kinds of games we're going to talk about not just superhero games per se although they seem to be the most prominent licensed games now Certainly but literally anything based on anything else like there was a was it super nintendo i think there's a i think it was either super nintendo or nintendo chester the cheetah game i want to say that's super nintendo i believe it was super nintendo which was of course awful as you'd expect right well they also um, had the the cool spot nes game as well as yo noid yeah, and these are all, for those who are not as old as me and Jeff, uh, uh, these are all mascots from foods or food-adjacent stuff that were created as well. I mean, the Cool Spot, the 7-Up um, mascot, yeah. I actually happen to love the Cool Spot game, though playing it recently realized it was not a good game. I just liked it. But I thought it had a great soundtrack aesthetic and design for essentially being something that's supposed to sell 7-Up. I have a similar feeling about the Yo Noid uh, NES game. It's actually in my small but, you know, proud NES collection. And mm-hmm. it's not a great game, but I always like popping it in and just goofing off for a little while. Um, another example of licensing that I... That I don't want to get too far off because uh, we got some other big stuff, but bands like just musicians. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Even in the pre-8-bit era, there was an Atari game based on Journey, the band Journey. And it involved huh. actually getting their instruments from other planets so that they could put on a concert. I, I didn't don't, know that. I don't know much else about the gameplay. This was something that um, I was made aware of a long time ago, and I've never owned uh, any Atari system, so I, I, I've never had the chance to like really delve into it. But just the knowledge in my head that it's just like, yeah, back in like '83, they made a game about Journey that like. Uh, <sighs> You, you want to talk about having nothing to do with the source material. I mean, I can't confirm or deny whether or not Steve Perry has been to another planet, but um, <laughs> look, I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm going with what I know here. I'm a simple man. <laughs> simple thoughts. That's fair. I mean, but yeah, no, but even in, I believe it was the early 90s that Revolution X came Revolution out, which X. was an Aerosmith arcade game that, I mean, sort of had something to do with Aerosmith. Like, it had their music, and they were kind of the leaders of this uprising. Like, it was... It was a clever idea, and oh, it yeah. functioned well as a shooting game. Um, but yeah, for the most part, didn't have anything to do with Aerosmith, but they damn sure licensed their music and likenesses. Oh, yeah, or like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Right. Another platformer game. Because, I mean, if we want to talk about like rock band-style licensing music for music games, that almost doesn't even feel like licensed games in the way that we're talking about it right now. No, that's, yeah, for yeah, sure. That That's like, I don't know. Releasing a movie soundtrack. It's like, yes, it's mu- music for a movie, but it's still music. That's it's it's almost too close to the idea. It's these these adaptations into something utterly different. You know, well, I think that's the key word is adaptation is what most of the licensed games we're talking about are adaptations of an already existing medium, whether it's comic books, TV, movie, whatever. How, how designers take these properties and go, how do we turn them into a video game? Absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, there have been some glorious successes and failures in the 8-bit generation, but I feel like once we got to, let's say, Xbox and PlayStation was the beginning of it, like, they they would have more to deal with because you couldn't just do a simple platformer anymore. They wouldn't really sell. You had to do a 3D platformer, which as Bubsy 3D has proven, if nothing else, is not as easy to do as you'd think. Yeah. And that wasn't even a licensed title. Yeah, you definitely got um, a lot of those 3D collectathons, which both Matt and I are, are fans of, but sure. in, in the license form and in that sort of like mediocre derivative way, to this day, they still make those. And mm, no. Well, yeah, like, I mean, DC, for the most part, had a hilarious history in gaming, whereas like X-Men found some success on the Super Nintendo oh, yeah. and the Genesis and all of that. You know, Batman and Superman specifically, because they're heroes with such a unique design, were almost impossible to get right in games, especially um, uh, Superman. And if we're going to talk about that generation of games, because of course the N64 was out at that time as well, Superman 64 is a notoriously terrible It It, um, it lives in the game. same house of shame as the X-Men NES game. And I'm sure there's a couple yeah. others we can think of. But And I, I think, and certainly with those two properties, it's trying to get to the essence of what makes those characters work. And I feel like there were some great X-Men games on the Sega Genesis, if only because of their aesthetic design and them being just mm-hmm. strong platformers on their own. They didn't necessarily yeah. feel like I am being an X-Man. Uh, the right. first time that that felt right to me was the X-Men Legends games, because the X-Men at the end of the day are a team. There's, you know, they, they may have their solo books and Wolverine is Wolverine, but... Um, like the idea of going as a small team, whether that's one player controlling the four characters or like you get four players together and everybody's yelling at each other, that feels more X-Men. And I don't know how they're going to get Superman to work in a game. I really don't know. Someone will figure it out. I'm not saying it's impossible, but flying through rings isn't the way to do it. No. And I think what was really terrible about that game is that they based it on the, the animated series, which was of course a huge success in yeah. the, in, you know in the wake of uh the Batman animated series yeah. and same people who did that in Justice League and all of those incredible Warner Brothers that, cartoons that whole Bruce Tim verse yeah right um but they didn't use it like it was yeah it was essentially a collectathon you had to fly through rings and like the controls were terrible and it didn't make sense i think the boldest version of a Superman game that I thought was an interesting concept, though it still didn't work, was when they did it for Superman Returns, which is the Brandon Routh movie. Uh-huh. Um, the idea was you had to protect the city, and the city was your life bar. And if the city got destroyed, you lost. Because at least in, in, in essence, like if you're not making Superman invulnerable, 
well, what's the point? That's that's Superman's superpower. Yeah. Like, besides kryptonite and magic and a few other things, like he's almost invulnerable. And so, like, I thought that was an interesting take. Of course, it didn't work because the mechanics didn't support it. Um, right. Whereas Batman, who had many failures um, in the old school generations as well, it wasn't until the Arkham series that they got. And I think one of the first comic book games that I felt like the character was the Arkham series. Like Arkham Asylum, you know, I remember playing that demo the first time, and this has come up a few times on the show. And the first time I did that upside down swoop where I grabbed the guy and then hung him by his feet, I was like, oh my God, I'm Batman. Yes. Like, you know, and that's that's not something licensed games always did. I mean, I'd go about as far back as the Nintendo games and say, like, in DuckTales, I felt like Scrooge McDuck. Like, in the cartoons, he was a badass. You know, the bouncing on his cane thing was a little odd. But otherwise, you know, you explored stuff, you collect money and riches, and you fight crazy things and get into crazy scraps like that. That's Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. You know, but other games, it was kind of like, here's a platformer where you are that character. It's close. But like the Arkham series, I was like, oh, my God, between the gadgets, the scenery, the soundtrack, everything else, like you actually felt like Batman. And Batman's an interesting one to look at because he has been such a perennial character and has been around for nearly a century right at like 70, 80 year range right now. And so yeah. he's always been there as far as as long as there's been video games. And so there have been a lot of attempts at getting that right. And there have been a lot of good ones and a lot of bad ones. And certainly uh, one that I go back to is I had a Game Gear growing up. So I think of a lot of Game Gear adaptations of these things. Right. And the Game Gear Batman Forever was not a good game. Um, it, no. It tried to do a very, like, rotoscopy kind of look. But... Um, it just was very pixelated and you would have to like, it was, it, it's Batman forever. So it's the Schumacher era and it's like gadgety is, is all get out. And so it's like, there's this Batarang and then there's this one and then there's these things. And it was like, figure out where to go. And it was a platformer that tried to be puzzly, but just kind of wasn't. And I don't know. I never got very far in it. By contrast, the Aladdin, I know we talked about Genesis and uh, Super Nintendo. They had a fantastic uh, Game Gear adaptation. It was the one for the Sega Master System. So actually, it wasn't a, a like a a downport or downgrade port of the Genesis one. It was its own game, and it was really good. But yeah, but Batman, yeah, you, they've tried that. They did those. They did the platformer. They've done. Um, I mean, they, they tried to do a bunch of ones. I remember. Um, Batman Rise of Sun Tzu they tried to do is like a wholly original adventure with a little bit of the idea of uh, the animated series as well. And it just fell flat. Yeah, trying to make Batman just to beat him up is not enough. And at the time, we couldn't figure out why as a kid, because of course you love watching Batman kick people's asses. But the reality is that Batman is more than that, and it's hard to realize that as a kid or a designer who has no experience with Batman. Yeah, Batman's more interesting when he's sitting at the Bat computer. Right. To be honest. And, you know, the Arkham gave you a lot of those things. I mean, going back to talking about the X-Men... Um, because they've had a ton of games as well. And then Wolverine's had a ton of his own games, some failures and some successes. Uh -huh. um, for me, the best one is actually something that like, I wanted to talk a little bit about, about adaptations surpassing the originals, which is often a point of contention. But Wolverine Origins is a hilariously terrible movie. Yes, It's fairly unanimous. I, as a diehard Wolverine fan... Um, thought it was hilariously terrible however the multi-platform xbox 360 generation um version of that the game was incredible because like arkham it made you feel like wolverine you could see him heal in real time on screen he would do lunge attacks when he attacked people limbs would fly off like you felt like wolverine it did boil down to a, a fairly um God of War-ish style game, but it still was fun and you felt like Wolverine. The writing was still fairly bad. They did get Hugh Jackman to do the voice and he did a good job, but the script was not fantastic. But it it was leaps and bounds better than the movie because it was a good, an average to good game based on a horrible movie. Yeah, if you want to look at Wolverine, if you want to cast him kind of in the mold of like Kratos, that actually fits. Like, the tortured warrior. And if you want to have some sneaking in there, you want to have some ninja e samurai style stuff, fantastic. It, it, it really gets into some of his other uh, deeper cut backstory. 
But if there's also just, well, claws come out and uh, people got to die, you feel like Wolverine. You know, that, right. that's a character that can sustain a beat em up. A lot of beat em ups do have a tendency to feel samey, tepid. I mean, just the same as platformers used to do. Um, one of my favorite uh, segments of Games Done Quick uh, marathons is when they do the bad game block. Yeah. A lot of them are just licensed platformers. You know, does Rocky and Bullwinkle need a platformer? Uh, no, 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 I don't think so. But they made one. <laughs> right, right. It, it, yeah, it, it's it's capturing that feeling. Um, actually, one that I enjoy is and going off, uh, moving moving away from superheroes for a moment, but we'll come back sure. because we're huge nerds. Um, Adventure Time, and. The first licensed game that they came out with, and it's the only one I've played, so it's the only one I can speak to, is uh, Adventure Time, Hey Ice King, Why'd You Steal Our Garbage? <laughs> Which already, um, that kind of title, it's like, no, this is this is Adventure Time. And they had creator, you know, uh, some of the creative team involved with it. And mm. the game that it most closely resembles is Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. Interesting. And that's perfect. Yeah, sure. And it's a much shorter game, and it's got, uh, you know, a decade and a half easily of design philosophy moved on from that NES game. And, I mean, uh, Legend of Zelda 2 is a game that I admit its flaws, but I love it. Sure. It's, you know, I I, I don't know if you want to call it the least Zelda-y or the weirdest or the hardest or whatever. I've still never beaten the game. Um, But I love it. And I love all of the, the risks that it takes and the little ideas that it has. And kind of having Finn being a character who, like, learns these little sword techniques and collects these things and goes into these certain dungeons and kind of has an overworld with all of these colorful and bizarre characters. They're a great uh, way to showcase all of the really just the weirdness of the land of Ooh. And I, I felt it was, you know, is it perfect? Is it great? It's a good game. And it's also a good adaptation, and I felt like Finn. And so, sure. yeah, so while across the board it might have like a 7.5 kind of score in your IGN, whatever, and review scores, we'll talk about those another day. But it was, yeah. I, came, I, I came away from it feeling very good about it. And actually, in, in talking about it, uh, I, I, I remembered it because I was uh, kind of reorganizing my collection earlier today, and I saw it and I went, I think this is do a replay. And that's. That's a really good endorsement. Yeah. I mean, so I do want, and, you know, I'm not going to go on a tangent too long, but I do want to go back to at some point in a future episode about ratings and rating games and reviewing games only because sometimes it does, like, we're at a point in, in I think, all media where good isn't enough. Everything has to be great or terrible. Something being okay is not good enough. And that frustrated me with a review I watched on Sonic Forces, which was a game I was looking forward to. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about it another time because so Sonic is, well, I guess technically sort of licensed now because he's across multi-platform. Anyway, um, but I was annoyed because at the end he was like, it's just okay, so don't get it. And I'm like, but why? It's okay. So I definitely want to come back to that. What I do want to talk about now is when in the modern era, how the licensing thing has gotten a little bizarro. And here's my example. All right. I haven't played any of these games or seen the movie, so this is only from an industry observation standpoint. Right. In the PlayStation era, mm -hmm. there were a lot of really great collect-a-thon games. Um, some of the pinnacle ones of action-adventure platformers were Jack and Daxter. Oh, yeah. And, an, and, of course, one we've talked about before, Ratchet and Clank. Yes. Which... I have never played. I like the idea of and have wanted to play and will, but have never played. It started out as this, uh, a video game series. It's had many, many sequels. And then, th I think last year now, they made a movie based on the original game. Yeah, it's maybe a year, year and a half. It, it, it was a recent one. Right, which... I thought it was a great idea. I, wa I still haven't seen it yet, and I want to, but I was like, it seems like something that would have the kind of heart that would make for a great kids movie. Mm -hmm. But then after that came out on PlayStation 4, they made a game. But the game is not based, it's not a revamp or an update of the original game. The game is based on the movie. So now we have a game and then a movie based on the game and then a game based on the movie based on the game. And they actually say that on the back of the case. Yeah. 
that it's not the a remake of the original, that it is an an adaptation of an adaptation. And Ratchet and Clank as a series has always been um, tongue firmly planted in cheek. It mm-hmm. has been self-referential. It is a reverent. It is a wonderful story, and it's like a whole big, crazy, sweeping adventure. But it's always got its you know little wink and a nod and a big, huge explosion. And so, sure. being able to do that—that that is a series that can get away with that and go the game based on the movie, based on the game. And you're like, well, of course. Sure. And what's funny to me is, like, I watch your review. I often watch Gerard the Completionist Khalil mm-hmm. on YouTube for a lot of info on games because he does really great. Uh, uh, walkthroughs of full games like just talking about them and when he reviewed that game he also admitted to having not played the originals but, and essentially said this is a fine starting point if you've never played the originals and you're interested in them the basics are here like this is a ratchet and clank game it's just based on the movie's version of the story which is a little bit different but it's an okay starting point point. and so i i've been wanting to play it for a while i haven't yet but i always thought that was really interesting um you know, and that a lot of people are saying, oh, it's not as good as the original. The original was more in depth. Is, does that really matter, though? If it's a, again, back to this that I brought up earlier, if it's a good game, if it's okay, then, and people want to play it, so let them play it. Um, but it's just interesting to see that kind of full circle. Um, another way that these kind of adaptations and properties have come full circle is we talked about last week the success of the Lego games and their plethora of achievements. Yes. We now have Lego sets based on movies and then games based on those lego sets and those movies and then also more recently they've been doing original stories with like marvel superheroes Mm -hmm. games but they're still based on legos based on comics based on whatever and it's just an interesting kind of black hole almost of adaptation that is really interesting to me especially since now we had we had lego batman Oh, yeah, I was about to bring up Lego Batman, yes. So we have Lego Batman The Games, Mm -hmm. which is based on the Lego play sets, which is based on the comic books. Mm -hmm. And those Lego Batman games had their own original story that were very Batman-esque, you know, dark and brooding, but with a nice tongue-in-cheek sense of humor for kids. Oh, yeah. Then we got the Lego movie, which was super meta, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And then we got the Lego Batman movie, which is based on Will Arnett's portrayal uh, of Batman in the Lego movie. Which, by the way, has is my favorite Batman film of the last 10 years. Which is what I've heard. I haven't seen it yet. But then I believe that also got a game. Just like Lego Ninjago, which has a new movie mm-hmm. based on a cartoon, based on a playset, which also now has a game based on that movie. And it's like, I mean, Lego must just print money at this point. Pretty I mean, much. They have a base level of how the games have to be good. And veteran gamers may care more, but... Younger gamers, for the most part, are going to be less particular by nature. I was when I was younger. I know my nephews and nieces are. And so there's just so much media and content. I feel a little overloaded by it. The fact that I haven't bought the last two Lego Batman games. I haven't seen the Lego Batman movie. I haven't seen Lego Ninjago. I haven't even engaged with that property at all. Yeah. And so it's just really interesting to me that cross-pollination of media and properties and adaptations is way more common now than it ever was before and it almost feels overwhelming yeah i i almost like i almost want to hear a glado style voice saying now you're thinking with porting yeah but it's just yeah it's one of those things that you know i wonder where will it stop i mean you know they've announced that lego dimensions is winding down i believe um which that was only a matter of time considering it was one of those skylanders buy a thing to do a thing games yeah that, those i think don't that's last the, forever yeah that's the point where kind of like when we were talking about peripherals uh several episodes ago um yeah. bringing it out like you can adapt between media back and forth back and forth i think that has a great deal of like motion, energy, momentum, whatever to it. But then once you start putting in a uh, extra monetary collection to it, it, yeah, it's exhausting and it, it has a shelf life. Um, I think the only reason Amiibos continue on the way they do is because it's directly from Nintendo. Just these are Nintendo right. properties. It, it's, it's too well enclosed. And that's the only reason they have any survival thus far. Everything else it's yeah, that, that, it, it doesn't work or it doesn't last. 
I'd be curious to know if Nintendo's taken any losses on Amiibo. I imagine they had to in the beginning. I mean, with the Switch now, I feel like they'll finally start to ramp up because, like, I never bought them for the 3DS. I just saw no reason, and mm-hmm. I never owned a Wii, uh, Wii U. But now that I have a Switch, I, of course, since have gotten three or four Amiibos because the, uh, it allows me to do stuff regularly in Mario Odyssey as well as a few other games, uh, which had not been previously the case with, like, Mario Kart and some others where you just unlock a thing and then you don't need it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, By the way, have you have you beaten Mario Odyssey yet? I have not. Oh no! Well, <laughs> I finished the story. Yes, no, not... that, that, that's <laughs> what I was getting at. No, I, I'm. I haven't finished Mario Odyssey yet because there's 999 stars. There's or yes. moons, whatever. We we have, we have not completionist it did yet. No, just... and I don't know that I will. I may lose interest. I haven't yet. Um, uh, but I only just started exploring the, the s- new spoiler area. Yeah, the, the new area you get when you beat the game that I'm not going to spoil for people. Um, yes, exactly. E- even though it's been on the internet. Also, I haven't gotten the costume there that's for that world, but I really want it because it's amazing and reminds me pretty much of all of it's, my youth. It's it's amazing. It's um, it, but but enough about Mario Odyssey. So going back to to adaptations, though, I think that the thing where Uh, these properties fall behind that are adapted to gaming is like any other adaptation. You know, if it's given to a studio who has no love of the the original property or knows anything about, you know, high-level game design or maybe they're a smaller studio, like, they're not going to deliver a product with the same care. I mean, that said, Warner Brothers is one of the biggest companies in the world, and they still can't make a decent Batman or Superman movie, so who knows? Yeah, and I think some of that, too, it's a little bit of, on the one hand, uh, like you were saying about um, Sonic Forces, there are games, there are ideas, there are whatever, that people are going to be drawn to checking them out simply because it's a property they enjoy, which is the point of licensed games in the first place. Hey, do you like Batman? Why not buy a Batman video game? That's right. that, that's the entire point. So, yeah, it's fine if something's a 7.5 across the board because it's like with all these, you know, average this kind of game, which one am I going to get? Well, I like Sonic, so I'm going to get the one with Sonic in it. I'm going to get the one that has a cameo from uh, Spider-Man. I'm going to get the one that has, you know, Shantae or Shovel Knight. I'm going to get, you know. Um, the, right. I, I had no interest in Blaster Master Zero until that happened, and now uh, yeah, I like it. But... And this is why they do that. But also nowadays, we are so well interconnected, uh, trivia-wise. You know, you look at the MCU films and you look at the, like, sedimentary cross-section of how deep do the references go or how do they work together? Why is it this color? Why did they use that number? You know, a wink and a nod throughout. And... You can see we, we almost have a higher standard for level of care. And you can even make a fairly average game using a known property and have a lot of love for that character or that property and infuse the average livable gameplay with really interesting tidbits, Easter eggs, n- winks and nods, like all of the little ways that you look at something and go, no, that makes perfect sense that it would go like that. You know, why, uh, I, you know, why a Wario game is more about collection and, and treasure than a Mario game is. Those aren't necessarily licenses, but off the top of my head while I'm rambling, like that kind of thing where it's, you know, the, the gameplay doesn't necessarily have to be mind-blowing, revolutionary. You know, not every game has to be. But if you just have that little bit of love, those little bit of like, no, no, they know what they're doing with this character. They adapt it well. That, yeah. That's and the actually, draw. and a good segue for that, and something else I want to talk to in the meta side of adaptation is how now we're at a point with adaptation within the gaming industry itself. I mean, look at Smash Brothers' success and that they've, ad- you know, they adapted Sonic, which is a Sega property, uh, Snake, which is a Konami property, mm-hmm. you know. All of these characters, and then it just grew and grew. You know, Ryu from Street Fighter, Bayonetta, who's also Sega, um, uh, Cloud from Final Fantasy, Mm -hmm. or like in the new Tekken, they have Noctis from the newest Final Fantasy. Like, now the gaming industry is borrowing from the gaming industry, which I think is really exciting. A lot of people were... Because that kind of borrowing, and this is where I think adaptations are at their best. If you can 
play something without getting it, finger quotes, it's why Marvel has been doing so well. Mm -hmm. You could see all the movies and know every little tidbit. But if you don't, you can still watch Civil War and go, oh, hey, I know that Ant-Man guy. Oh, this is a really cool scene. Oh, on to the next thing. You don't have to know who Jeff Goldblum's playing. You can just enjoy Jeff Goldblum. Correct, which everybody enjoys Jeff Goldblum. Mm -hmm. Um, The same thing with gaming. Like, I I mean, I honestly still haven't played a Fire Emblem game, but I loved playing as Ike in the second game because he was awesome, and it didn't matter that I knew the reference. You know, and he's a Nintendo property. He's not even on a property outside that. But, like, I I don't really play Metal Gear Solid games. Snake was one of my favorite characters to play as because I could mess with people. You know, it's that kind of powerful design that surpasses whether you get the reference which is ultimately what an adaptation is about and i think it's the same thing with the people who are bitching about noctis being in tekken like who cares if you don't like final fantasy if he's a badass character then just play as him who cares if you get the reference yeah it's it's a matter of like look the meta of fighting games people are going to pick the same damn three characters anyway. What (laughs) does it freaking matter who the DLC characters are? They're there for people who just want to sit down and goof off. I want want to be a Kuma fighting a bear named Kuma. Yes, exactly. Kuma Akuma. I want, like, uh, the, the when... Uh, my buddy Greg and I, we both downloaded, we both got Tekken 7, and we hung out and played it, and we were laughing our faces off uh, having bear battles. Or, like, <laughs> like we, we would, like, try to fight exactly how we think these characters would fight, and just, like, we, we were, like, weak, just laughing so hard at this stuff. You know, we're not going and playing competitively, and uh, our, our fun isn't hurting your fun, buddy. Sorry. Um... And on the, the Ike and Marth idea of Smash Brothers, Fire Emblem had had not come out in America at all when they were in Melee. And the popularity of those characters drew attention to the Fire Emblem series, which is now why they're in America, why there have been re-releases, why there have been adaptations, and why it's not a question whether or not Fire Emblem games are going to reach the Western shores. They just are, the same way as you wouldn't question, oh, they're making a new Legend of Zelda starring a, starring Link. Are they going to bring it to America? Of course they are. Right. I, I had that caveat of Link because there is a game starring Tingle that has not reached America. I, oh, I'm fairly aware of that, oh. where you collect money to live and the money is your life force. I've watched a ton of videos on it. It is fascinating. It, it is. It absolutely is. But that but that's another instance of that. Uh, yeah, the, games can reference other games. Games can adapt from other games and can borrow from other games. That shows the health of the medium and that shows its standalone quality as a medium. I mean, of course, there are books of films and films of books and TV shows of cart uh, of you know of, of of all sorts. Of, like cross pollination is inevitable. That's that's no big deal. But the fact that video games as a medium, um, I mean, we are still learning the language. We are still learning the the ways and this and that. I mean, in films, you know, you can have things where depending upon the creator. You know, Robert Rodriguez and the, the whole, like, Machete, the character, exists in the Spy Kids universe. Which right. Which is insane and wonderful, and I love it. Um, but well, sure. Or it's like, for me, like, in, uh, and it's very small here, but in Avengers, when Iron Man's about to take off carrying um, um, Hawkeye, he says, clench up, Legolas. Like, directly referring to Tolkien. So in this comic book world, this cherished storybook is exists which is like huge to me because it's just cool to see how these things mix together and exist in similar universes because none of this is exists in a vacuum right. um and yeah we things all good design stands on the shoulders of giants that is how we see further it is how we go further sure. and i mean honestly to bring super mario odyssey back into this talk about licensed games um, Super Mario Odyssey, I feel, is so successful and such a. I love the game so very much because it takes the best of all that has come before. Yeah, it is an adaptation of itself. Yeah, um, essentially, it's you know, not without its flaws, but it's for sure one of the best because of it acknowledged what came before it and did some great things with it. Yeah, and that's just within its own framework and it, right. and it is with great care and love 
for that character, that world, that system, that everything. And all of the little deep cuts come up and you go like, oh, man, that. And, oh, you know, some of this, you know, pre end of story and post end of story. And I mean, of course, naturally, once you finish the main story, the fan service just flows. Oh, yeah. But, just flows. And for a, a, a character that's over 30 years old, you got a lot of deep cuts to go with. That's why the MCU can do that as well. And oh, my God. I never realized that Mario is almost as old as I am. That's terrifying. Mario is as old as I am. <laughs> well, because you're younger than me, but no, yeah. No, Mario was really, like, certainly in America, or was it the Japanese? The, the Super Mario Brothers released, I think, like five days before I was born. <laughs> so anytime those things come up, it's like, oh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that, right. <laughs> right, I'm old. All right, got it. Uh, so there you go. But no, and, and I think it's a great thing when... Uh, that kind of cross-pollination can happen within games. Mm-hmm. And not just in the massive crossover games like your uh, Marvel vs. Capcom or Project X Zone or Super Smash Brothers or anything like that. But, you know, when sometimes it can be a bit DLC-ish. It can be a bit whatever. But why not? Yeah. You know, and you can even consider games like Kingdom Hearts a licensed game because it, they license the Disney characters. It, you know? it, it is very much a licensed game. And, but they're like, see, that's one where, like, whether you love or hate the ridiculousness that has gone on with that series before we got a proper third game, the fact that Donald, Mickey, and Goofy are in a game where their purpose to, is to serve an original narrative is incredible. Yeah. And that's another game where, again, they design a very Final Fantasy game with its own twists. And then Disney characters, and it's like there they are, but they, yep. but just because it's okay, there's Disney characters, they don't just throw it in and call it a day. They put all kinds of detail work into it. Um, like it, it, it tickled me when in Kingdom Hearts one you go into Ariel's world and Donald is an octopus. He's not. Yeah. A, he's not a merman. He's not a turtle. He's not. You know. The, Goofy's a turtle because he uses a shield. Okay, there that all works. And the main magic user of the area, Ursula, also is you know a cephalopod. So yeah. so a Donald. Okay, yep. cool. Your logic is not flawed. It's it's accurate. Game, good job. Yeah, like well, and in any of these games, like you can go wildly awry in terms of realistic ideas, but if right. you stick with it, if you if you Again, it's showing that care. It's, you know, DuckTales. Okay, you've, we've never seen Scrooge McDuck pogo on a cane in the cartoons. Maybe they do it in the new one. I don't know. But once you work with that, it's like, okay. And then everything else just fits. And the design works around it. And it's like, sure. oh, you you built this world for this idea. Great. And so, you know... uh, and there's all kinds of licensed games that go far beyond the pale of what we're talking about. Um, For we, sure. We mentioned musicians as kind of an aside, and we've mostly been talking about cartoons and comic books. But there's all kinds of other, like, mascot-style things, mascot-style games that, in their own way, become sort of a, uh, a, a rabbit's hole of adaptation. I'm trying to remember. There is a... It's a it's a ninja based character. I think Zoop. No, that's the that puzzle game. Um, there is a like ninja character that's in a lot more European games mm-hmm. that um, got so thoroughly screwed around, passed around between companies. Um, there is a game that is infamously bad that is actually meant to be a, a contract fulfillment or was a, a an offshoot of it. Uh, do you know the Wii game Ninja Bread Man? I do. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. Ninja Bread Man was originally supposed to be one of one of this character. Um, it might even be like just Zoom. Um, I'm figuring this out. Well, you figure it out, and I'll uh, I'll start wrapping us up because I wanted to actually, we'll, and we'll come back to your ninja adaptation in a moment. But I do want to talk about our favorite adaptations of game. You know, games added adapting something else because I always like to bring out the listeners favorites as well. Yes. Um, so, so I, my, I mean, if you couldn't tell, because I did talk 
quite a bit about Batman. Ninja Turtles is a, is a close second with Turtles in Time as my favorite adaptation, but mm-hmm. I think my number one favorite adaptation is Arkham City, the best of the Arkham series, because it's a game that not only immersed you in a world that you were fairly familiar with, it took unique takes on characters. It had so many interweaving threads that really worked really well, mm-hmm. but also the whole time you never think... I'm playing a game as Batman the entire time you thinking I am Batman. And while you don't need that for an adaptation to work, it worked best for me because I, you know, the games that I get really attached to is when I have a, a a voiceless avatar that I get to pretend is me or a voiced avatar that I get to pretend is me one way or the Um, other. Right. And in this case, I really felt like I was Batman. I mean, it helped that it had Kevin Conroy and, and you know, uh, Mark Hamill and all of those voices that they could get from the uh, animated series to reprise their roles. But still, beyond that, it just it really made me feel like I was in that world. And so it's definitely one of my favorite adaptations. Yeah. Incidentally, I figured out the name of the character. Zool. Z-O-O-L. <laughs> this weird like bug ninja guy that actually was very well loved and that was just a uh an unfortunate chapter in uh the deflation of that property i'm that out of the way i'm trying to think of like what my favorite adaptation is and i'm kind of drawing up some blanks here like i'm think i'm thinking of some good ones like i am a x-men legends 2 ranks up there for me i'm a big dungeon crawler style fan and mm-hmm. That, that one I have, like, such great memories. It's such a good um, story, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word, of the coming together of the X-Men and the Brotherhood against Apocalypse. Um, I like a lot of the old Disney stuff. I'm like, I'm just trying to rattle off to think of what my favorite is. I'm not, not sure here. Uh, that happens sometimes. I think it was clearly defined for me, and my inspiration for this conversation was essentially... Wolverine Origins and the Arkham series because mm-hmm. they're some of my favorite adaptations. But, you know, I mean, the ones that you're mentioning are incredible. I mean, for sure, uh, Marvel, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 and 2, which was the next evolution of the X-Men uh-huh. Legends games, are up there for me, especially the second one because it had this... It did a really cool take on Civil War and then broke off to an original story that was bizarre but not unreasonable. And so I thought it was a really cool way of kind of getting us a adaptation of a comic book series before it became a movie and then still had some original content in it you know what i'm gonna go a little off our uh what we've been talking about and i th- I think i've uh i got kind of a tie here okay same same property two different games star wars oh yeah okay x-wing of course and rogue squadron for the n64 both really great adaptations, really great games. I, I like Star Fox 64 style uh, shooters and gameplay like that. And Rogue right. Squadron did a really good job. It's a really good game. And I mean, even the sequel on the GameCube was great. But I, I, I put more hours into the N64 uh, one. So that's that's why I got that. And for the same reason, X-Wing. Um, uh, TIE Fighter, I know, is objectively a better evolution of, of the game. But... I spent so much time on X-Wing. I I did all five tour of duties, The even the, the expansion ones, one with the B-Wing in it. I got all the patches. I got all the stuff. I remember my brother and I, like, he would fight with the joystick, and I would have the keyboard, and we basically would two-man so I could get, all, like, all of the adjustments to shields and missiles and this and that. We, we, um, we did missions where we ended up taking down Star Destroyer single-handedly. And if you want a feeling of power... Take down a Star Destroyer with a Y-Wing. Right. So I, that's another one where it's, I love Star Wars as a series, as a property, as a franchise. And that's one where, you know what? I, I feel bad that I didn't bring it up sooner in the episode. Let's, we'll talk about Star Wars another time. but Sure. Have, I feel like we could do a whole episode on Star Wars about and to gaming. Say, have, there's uh, so much gaming that's been around Star Wars. Well, And as well as Star Wars versus Star Trek. Yeah. Because of the franchise wars between them and the way that they've been adapted into games. Because I've played a good handful of Star Trek games and a veritable ton of Star Wars games. And that's kind of about the ratio of my experience with them. And I and I actually have a great deal of love for both. So I think that'd be an interesting uh, study and adaptation 
style and space opera. Yeah, I would agree. Considering there are like there's a countless amount of Star Wars games, both original story and adaptations of the movies that have come out that have both succeeded and failed. Um, you know, like the Star Wars game for um, the Connect, which we won't go into. Um, uh, but although I believe we did talk about on our Rhythm Game episode a bit, but yes, it came you know. Up. It, 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 it's it's uh, yeah i think that it's like trying to talk about the beatles on one uh, with other things on a music podcast like it's just yeah. star wars has been around so long and they've done so many games i feel like on so many different consoles on pc and different places different styles like it's just a whole other conversation and actually you know what this is a perfect time because of battlefront yeah and talking yeah. about Pointless Achievements last episode and talking about licensing being a draw on a money shill and and everything else. Let's talk let's take a few seconds here. I know we were kind of winding down. Let's talk about Battlefront for a second. Right, which is a franchise that I've loved. Like I loved the original Battlefronts. I bought the new f- Battlefront and was horribly disappointed with what little it had. And so I was super excited about Battlefront 2 having an original story that wasn't going to be very long, but I would play a bunch of times and then play the verses. And then the loot box nonsense happened. Yes. The pay to win. Yes. It looked as though they were going to fix all of the mistakes of the previous Battlefront. And then that happened. And talking about the idea of achievements just to have them, the idea of Star Wars is a very beloved franchise that is an objective statement it is a beloved franchise it is also a hated franchise but it is a um passionate one yes and star wars to me is like queen as a band it (laughs) it is ever a favorite in my life i may get distracted by other bands other movies other franchises other things and then i will come back to it and just kind of have a moment of like oh man this is really good like head in yep. my hand, just like, oh my god, this is this is really good, guys. So I, I I'm passionate about it, and it has all sorts of characters that people love, and all sorts of of things that people get behind and want to go for. And okay, you want to talk about the idea of okay, you know, not every adult has the all the time to put into mastering these games and this and that, and so you know, those people will have money and want to put it forward to earn those things. I really have some vitriol for that concept, and so do at least 700,000 people who have downvoted on Reddit that EA comment on the whole thing, which I'm I'm very proud of how hated that comment is. Um, Just simply because of the fact, uh, on a a flip side of things, uh, I was thinking of some of the Star Wars games that I own, personally. One of them Mm -hmm. is a fighting game called Star Wars Masters of Terrace Kazi. I remember that for the the PlayStation. Yeah, it is. It's, it's not a good game. No. It's not a good game. It's just... I played it so much. It's not a good game. No. Um, now, you can unlock a lot of characters in that game. And you you need to, to do all sorts of things to unlock Darth Vader. To unlock um, Mara Jade. And I think that was the one of the few games where you could actually play as her. So, like... That was insane, and I was a huge fan of, like, all of the novels that were out and canon at the time, so, like, I went nuts over that. Um, One of the characters you could unlock was Johto Cast, which is a copycat bounty hunter who styles himself after Boba Fett. And I spent so much time unlocking this character that played identically to Boba Fett. It was essentially unlocking the shiny Pokemon version of Boba Fett. Um... (laughs) And you know what? I put the time in for it. And none of the stuff, and it wasn't like uh, you needed to play this many hours for that to happen. No, you needed to complete this skill challenge to unlock it. A lot of the stuff in Battlefront to unlock, to receive, to everything else, didn't require necessarily a point of skill. They required your patience and time and just waiting for it to be unlocked. And people did the math, and it was years of waiting or spend all of this money. And if you want to design a game where people are coming to it because they love a franchise and you design ideas around it you, uh, with, with love for the trivia and lore of it and then use that as a reason to just get so, like, to put price tags on everything, 
not even on aesthetic ideas or not even as an alternative to, to you don't have enough time to master this skill. It's like you don't want to wait for it, pay for it. It's yeah. not it's not it's not earn it. It's wait for it. Well, yeah, it's why like I feel like the successes in that model have always been Blizzard because they've always, you know, like with Heroes of the Storm, it's like you can unlock costumes, which the character is still the character. It's just you get something cool, customized to show that you put in the hours, but it doesn't effectively change gameplay or change who you get to play as. Right. Because everyone can unlock all the characters they want and the characters change in value, but they don't they don't block you out of having to spend money you can but you can also earn the money by playing the game yeah but and you but it's it. a reasonable amount of time and they give you you know boosts so you earn experience and money faster and all of that stuff which it doesn't sound like they were going to do with battlefront it was literally just waste so much time or just pay and you get it and it's like why why you know the reason people are buying these games is yes you like playing as a soldier or stormtrooper but you also want to play as those big characters and fuck shit up yeah and if you want to make it like get this high on the leaderboard and you earn it or or, or based on these like coins and things based on your achievement okay fine but when it's like you get one loot box a day or you get so much of this per this time, you don't put a freemium pay to win model on a $60 retail game. No, that's you put that on a free to play game because then at least it makes some semblance of sense. Yes. And even games like um, I'm thinking of Smash Brothers where you unlock characters often based on the amount of time you spend playing. Yeah. Now, you the game is designed so that you spend time playing, but it also multiplies based on how many people are playing you know right. you, you spend 20 hours playing total that counts for every player so if you've got four player matches going on after five hours of playing that counts as 20 because five times four and so an afternoon of hey i just got the game let's go to town is gonna unlock that character yeah and and it's i i i have Feelings and anger beyond words. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really approached the freemium and the free-to-play model on the podcast in no, yet. No, I And I want to. I'm glad you brought up Battlefront here because I, I have a friend, Dan, who is a member of the Dinosaur Machines podcast as well mm -hmm. as um, a member of Hit Buttons, which is a YouTube channel. And he recently released a video about uh, Battlefront and the BS that they're pulling because he canceled his reserve on the game because of it and he's the one who got me into battlefront and star wars galaxies and so like for a diehard super fan like that to cancel their pre-order you know they've done something wrong yeah and so i i want to talk about it um i have two homework assignments for our listeners who are always so gracious to engage us let us know what your favorite adaptations are of uh, video game adaptations because i'm always curious to know um, whether it's one of the games we've mentioned or not. But also, let us know what you think about the Battlefront thing. You know, I'm curious to see how angry or not angry other people are. I mean, I suppose if you have a ton of disposable income, you don't care. And that's fair, I guess. But as someone who's not that person, you know, yeah. it, it's it's frustrating. And I think even those people, it's like there's no... Those people... Everyone wants to be challenged, I feel like. That's why we play video games. Unless you're playing a video game specifically not to be challenged. Like a narrative or whatever. And you're getting something else out of it. But something but, like Battlefront with an online... Uh, like a, a multiplayer aspect, of course it's challenge. And it's conquer and it's win. Yeah. So it just... It doesn't make sense. So please let us know your thoughts either in the comments on Facebook, on Twitter, or anywhere else. You can email us as well. Um, thank you again so much for listening as always um enjoy your holiday we will be back after thanksgiving of course with more of this and i think we may be jumping into either a star wars episode or a free-to-play episode based on jeff's vitriol um, yeah so more it's, on it's, that. it's not going to dissipate in the next two weeks it's it's yeah yeah um, but but thank you again. Please reach out on all social media. Tell your friends. Even if you just tell one friend who loves video games about our podcast, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, we love doing it for us, but we also love doing it for you guys. So thank you, as always, for listening. Yeah, we are always appreciate you listening. We always appreciate the conversations that come from this. That's, that's what it's all about. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, once again, I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And happy gaming.